The Zongnu Chinese, Xiongnu Wade Giles, Xiong Nu were a confederation of nomadic peoples who, according to ancient Chinese sources, inhabited the Eastern Asian steppe from the 3rd century BC to the late 1st century AD. Chinese sources report that Modu Chanu, the supreme leader after 209 BC, founded the Xiongnu Empire. After their previous overlords, the Yuji, migrated into Central Asia during the 2nd century BC, the Xiongnu became a dominant power on the steppes of northeast Central Asia, centered on an area known later as Mongolia. The Xiongnu were also active in areas now part of Siberia, Inner Mongolia, Gansu, and Xinjiang. Their relations with adjacent Chinese dynasties to the southeast were complex, with repeated periods of conflict and intrigue, alternating with exchanges of tribute, trade, and marriage treaties. Attempts to identify the Xiongnu with later groups of the Western Eurasian steppe remain controversial. Scythians and Sarmatians were concurrently to the west. The identity of the ethnic core of Xiongnu has been a subject of varied hypotheses, because only a few words, mainly titles and personal names, were preserved in the Chinese sources. The name Xiongnu may be cognate with that of the Huns or the Huna, although this is disputed. Other linguistic links, all of them also controversial, proposed by scholars include Iranian, Mongolic, Turkic, Uralic, Yeniseian, Tibeto-Burman or multi-ethnic. History <inaudible> Early history An early reference to the Xiongnu was by the Han dynasty historian Sima Qian who wrote about the Xiongnu in the records of the Grand Historian c. 100 BC, drawing a distinct line between the settled Waxia people Chinese to the pastoral nomads Xiongnu, characterizing it as two polar groups in the sense of a civilization versus an uncivilized society, the Huayi distinction. Pre-Han sources often classified the Xiongnu as a Hu people, which was a blanket term for nomadic people in general. It only became an ethnonym for the Xiongnu during the Han. Ancient China often came in contact with the Shenyan and the Shirong nomadic peoples. In later Chinese historiography, some groups of these peoples were believed to be the possible progenitors of the Xiongnu people. These nomadic people often had repeated military confrontations with the Shang and especially the Zhou, who often conquered and enslaved the nomads in an expansion drift. During the Warring States period, the armies from the Qin, Zhao, and Yan states were encroaching and conquering various nomadic territories that were inhabited by the Xiongnu and other Hu peoples. Sinologist Edwin Pulleyblank argued that the Xiongnu were part of a Shirong group called Yik, who had lived in Shanbei and had been influenced by China for centuries, before they were driven out by the Qin dynasty. Qin's campaign against the Xiongnu expanded Qin's territory at the expense of the Xiongnu. In 215 BC, Qin Shi Huang sent General Meng Tian to conquer the Xiongnu and drive them from the Ordos Loop, which he did later that year. After the catastrophic defeat at the hands of Meng Tian, the Xiongnu leader Tumen was forced to flee far into the Mongolian plateau. The Qin Empire became a threat to the Xiongnu, which ultimately led to the reorganization of the many tribes into a confederacy. Xiongnu tribes Chubei Huyan Lan tribe Luandi Cholan Zubu Topic State formation In 209 BC, three years before the founding of Han China, the Xiongnu were brought together in a powerful confederation under a new Chanu, Modu Chanu. This new political unity transformed them into a more formidable state by enabling formation of larger armies and the ability to exercise better strategic coordination. The Xiongnu adopted many of the Chinese agriculture techniques such as slave labor for heavy labor, wore silk like the Chinese, and lived in Chinese-style homes. The reason for creating the confederation remains unclear. Suggestions include the need for a stronger state to deal with the Qin unification of China that resulted in a loss of the Ordos region at the hands of Meng Tian or the political crisis that overtook the Xiongnu in 215 BC when Qin armies evicted them from their pastures on the Yellow River. After forging internal unity, Modu expanded the empire on all sides. To the north, he conquered a number of nomadic peoples, including the Dingaling of southern Siberia. 
He crushed the power of the Donghu people of eastern Mongolia and Manchuria as well as the Yuji in the Hexi corridor of Gansu, where his son, Jiju, made a skull cup out of the Yuji king. Modu also reoccupied all the lands previously taken by the Qin general Meng Tian. Under Modu's leadership, the Xiongnu threatened the Han dynasty, almost causing Emperor Gaozu, the first Han emperor, to lose his throne in 200 BC. By the time of Modu's death in 174 BC, the Xiongnu had driven the Yuji from the Hexi Corridor, killing the Yuji king in the process and asserting their presence in the western regions. The Xiongnu were recognized as the most prominent of the nomads bordering the Chinese Han Empire and during early relations between the Xiongnu and the Han, the former held the balance of power. According to the Book of Han, later quoted in Duan Chengxi's 9th century miscellaneous morsels from Yuyang, also, according to the Han Shu, Wang Wu, Wang Wu and others were sent as envoys to pay a visit to the Xiongnu. According to the customs of the Xiongnu, if the Han envoys did not remove their tallies of authority, and if they did not allow their faces to be tattooed, they could not gain entrance into the yurts. Wang Wu and his company removed their tallies, submitted to tattoo, and thus gained entry. The Shanu looked upon them very highly. Topic: Zongnu hierarchy. After Modu, later leaders formed a dualistic system of political organization with the left and right branches of the Zongnu divided on a regional basis. The Chanu or Shanu, a ruler equivalent to the Emperor of China, exercised direct authority over the central territory. Longcheng, Long Sheung near the Orkhon inscriptions in modern Mongolia, became the annual meeting place and served as the Zongnu capital. The ruler of the Zongnu was called the Chanu. Under him were the Tuki kings. The Tuki king of the left was normally the heir presumptive. Next lower in the hierarchy came more officials in pairs of left and right, the Guli, the army commanders, the great governors, the Dunghu and the Guda. Beneath them came the commanders of detachments of 1,000, of 100, and of 10 men. This nation of nomads, a people on the march, was organized like an army. Yap, apparently describing the early period, places the Chanyu's main camp north of Shaanxi with the Tuki king of the left holding the area north of Beijing and the Tuki king of the right holding the Ordos Loop area as far as Gansu. Gruset, probably describing the situation after the Xiongnu had been driven north, places the Chanyu on the upper Orkhon River near where Genghis Khan would later establish his capital of Karakoram. The Tuki king of the left lived in the east, probably on the High Carolan River. The Tuki king of the right lived in the west, perhaps near present-day Uliastai in the Kongai Mountains. The marriage treaty system In the winter of 200 BC, following a siege of Taiyuan, Emperor Gaozu of Han personally led a military campaign against Modun. At the Battle of Baidang, he was ambushed reputedly by 300,000 elite Zongnu cavalry. The emperor was cut off from supplies and reinforcements for seven days, only narrowly escaping capture. The Han Chinese sent princesses to marry Zongnu leaders in their efforts to stop the border raids. Along with arranged marriages, the Han sent gifts to bribe the Zongnu to stop attacking. After the defeat at Pingcheng, the Han emperor abandoned a military solution to the Zongnu threat. Instead, in 198 BC, the courtier Lu Jing was dispatched for negotiations. The peace settlement eventually reached between the parties included a Han princess given in marriage to the Chanu called Hekin Chinese, Hei Chin literally, harmonious kinship, periodic gifts to the Zongnu of silk, distilled beverages and rice, equal status between the states, and the Great Wall as mutual border. This first treaty set the pattern for relations between the Han and the Zongnu for 60 years. Up to 135 BC, the treaty was renewed nine times, each time with an increase in the gifts. In 192 BC, Modun even asked for the hand of Emperor Gao's widow Empress Lu Ji. His son and successor, the energetic Ji Yu, known as the Laoshang Chanu, continued his father's expansionist policies. Laoshang succeeded in negotiating with Emperor Wen terms for the maintenance of a large-scale government-sponsored market system. While the Xiongnu benefited handsomely, from the Chinese perspective marriage treaties were costly, humiliating, and ineffective. Laoshang showed that he did not take the peace treaty seriously. On one occasion his scouts penetrated to a point near Chang'an. 
In 166 BC he personally led 140,000 cavalry to invade Anding, reaching as far as the imperial retreat at Yang. In 158 BC, his successor sent 30,000 cavalry to attack Shangdang and another 30,000 to Yunjiang. The Xiongnu also practiced marriage alliances with Han dynasty officers and officials who defected to their side. The older sister of the Chanu the Zongnu ruler was married to the Zongnu general Zhao Xin, the Marquis of Xi who was serving the Han dynasty. The daughter of the Chanu was married to the Han Chinese general Li Ling after he surrendered and defected. The Yenisei Kyrgyz Kagans claimed descent from Li Ling. Another Han Chinese general who defected to the Zongnu was Li Guangli who also married a daughter of the Chanu. When the Eastern Jin dynasty ended the Shenbei Northern Wei received the Han Chinese Jin prince Sima Chuji si Ma Chuji as a refugee. A Northern Wei Shenbei princess married Sima Chuji, giving birth to Sima Jinlong si Ma Jin Long. Northern Liang Zongnu king Juku Mujian's daughter married Sima Jinlong. War with Han Dynasty The Han Dynasty made preparations for war when the Han Emperor Wu dispatched the explorer Zhang Qian to explore the mysterious kingdoms to the west and to form an alliance with the Yuji people in order to combat the Zongnu. During this time Zhang married a Zongnu wife, who bore him a son, and gained the trust of the Zongnu leader. While Zhang Qian did not succeed in this mission, his reports of the West provided even greater incentive to counter the Xiongnu hold on westward routes out of China, and the Chinese prepared to mount a large-scale attack using the Northern Silk Road to move men and material. While Han China was making preparations for a military confrontation from the reign of Emperor Wen, the break did not come until 133 BC, following an abortive trap to ambush the Chanu at Meiyi. By that point the empire was consolidated politically, militarily and economically, and was led by an adventurous pro-war faction at court. In that year, Emperor Wu reversed the decision he had made the year before to renew the peace treaty. Full-scale war broke out in autumn 129 BC, when 40,000 Chinese cavalry made a surprise attack on the Xiongnu at the border markets. In 127 BC, the Han general Wei Qing retook the Ordos. In 121 BC, the Xiongnu suffered another setback when Huo Qubing led a force of light cavalry westward out of Longxi and within six days fought his way through five Xiongnu kingdoms. The Xiongnu Hunya king was forced to surrender with 40,000 men. In 119 BC both Huo and Wei, each leading 50,000 cavalrymen and 100,000 foot soldiers in order to keep up with the mobility of the Xiongnu, many of the non-cavalry Han soldiers were mobile infantrymen who traveled on horseback but fought on foot, and advancing along different routes, forced the Chanu and his court to flee north of the Gobi Desert. Major logistical difficulties limited the duration and long-term continuation of these campaigns. According to the analysis of Yan Yu, Yan Yu the difficulties were twofold. Firstly there was the problem of supplying food across long distances. Secondly, the weather in the northern Xiongnu lands was difficult for Han soldiers, who could never carry enough fuel. According to official reports, the Xiongnu lost 80,000 to 90,000 men, and out of the 140,000 horses the Han forces had brought into the desert, fewer than 30,000 returned to China. As a result of these battles, the Chinese controlled the strategic region from the Ordos and Gansu corridor to Lop Nor. They succeeded in separating the Xiongnu from the Chang peoples to the south, and also gained direct access to the western regions. Because of strong Chinese control over the Xiongnu, the Xiongnu became unstable and were no longer a threat to the Han Chinese. Ban Chao, Protector General Dohu Duhu, of the Han Dynasty, embarked with an army of 70,000 men in a campaign against the Xiongnu insurgents who were harassing the trade route now known as the Silk Road. His successful military campaign saw the subjugation of one Xiongnu tribe after another. Ban Chao also sent an envoy named Gan Ying to Dachin, Rome. Ban Chao was created the Marquis of Dingyuan, Ding Yuan Hu, i.e., the Marquis who stabilized faraway places for his services to the Han Empire and returned to the capital Luoyang at the age of 70 years and died there in the year 102. Following his death, the power of the Xiongnu in the western regions increased again, and the emperors of subsequent dynasties were never again able to reach so far to the west. Xiongnu <laughs> Civil War 60 BC. 
When a Chanu died, power could pass to his younger brother if his son was not of age. This system, which can be compared to Gaelic tanistry, normally kept an adult male on the throne, but could cause trouble in later generations when there were several lineages that might claim the throne. When the 12th Chanu died in 60 BC, power was taken by Woyankudi, a grandson of the 12th Chanu's cousin. Being something of a usurper, he tried to put his own men in power, which only increased the number of his enemies. The 12th Chanu's son fled east and, in 58 BC, revolted. Few would support Woyankudi and he was driven to suicide, leaving the rebel son, Huhanye, as the 14th Chanu. The Woyankudi faction then set up his brother, Tuki, as Chanu 58 BC. In 57 BC three more men declared themselves Chanu. Two dropped their claims in favor of the third who was defeated by Tuki in that year and surrendered to Huhanye the following year. In 56 BC Tuki was defeated by Huhanye and committed suicide, but two more claimants appeared, Runjen and Huhanye's elder brother Gigi Chanu. Runjen was killed by Gigi in 54 BC, leaving only Gigi and Huhanye. Gigi grew in power, and, in 53 BC, Huhanye moved south and submitted to the Chinese. Huhanye used Chinese support to weaken Gigi, who gradually moved west. In 49 BC, a brother Tatuki set himself up as Chanu and was killed by Gigi. In 36 BC, Gigi was killed by a Chinese army while trying to establish a new kingdom in the far west near Lake Balkash. <laughs> Tributary relations with the Han In 53 BC Huhanye Hu Han Xie decided to enter into tributary relations with Han China. The original terms insisted on by the Han court were that, first, the Chanu or his representatives should come to the capital to pay homage, secondly, the Chanu should send a hostage prince, and thirdly, the Chanu should present tribute to the Han emperor. The political status of the Xiongnu in the Chinese world order was reduced from that of a brotherly state to that of an outer vassal. Why Shane? During this period, however, the Xiongnu maintained political sovereignty and full territorial integrity. The Great Wall of China continued to serve as the line of demarcation between Han and Xiongnu. Hu Hanye sent his son, the wise king of the right, Shulujutang, to the Han court as hostage. In 51 BC he personally visited Chang'an to pay homage to the emperor on the Lunar New Year. In the same year, another envoy Qijushan Ji Ju Shan, was received at the Sweet Spring Palace in the northwest of modern Shaanxi. On the financial side, Huhanye was amply rewarded in large quantities of gold, cash, clothes, silk, horses and grain for his participation. Huhanye made two further homage trips, in 49 BC and 33 BC, with each one the imperial gifts were increased. On the last trip, Huhanye took the opportunity to ask to be allowed to become an imperial son-in-law. As a sign of the decline in the political status of the Xiongnu, Emperor Yuan refused, giving him instead five ladies in waiting. One of them was Wang Zhaojun, famed in Chinese folklore as one of the four beauties. When Jiji learned of his brother's submission, he also sent a son to the Han court as hostage in 53 BC. Then twice, in 51 BC and 50 BC, he sent envoys to the Han court with tribute. But having failed to pay homage personally, he was never admitted to the tributary system. In 36 BC, a junior officer named Chen Tang, with the help of Gan Yanshou, protector general of the western regions, assembled an expeditionary force that defeated him at the Battle of Jiji and sent his head as a trophy to Chang'an. Tributary relations were discontinued during the reign of Hudurshi 18 AD to 48, corresponding to the political upheavals of the Xin dynasty in China. The Xiongnu took the opportunity to regain control of the western regions, as well as neighboring peoples such as the Wuwan. In 24 AD, Hudurshi even talked about reversing the tributary system. Topic: <laughs> Southern Xiongnu and Northern Xiongnu. The Xiongnu's new power was met with a policy of appeasement by Emperor Guangwu. At the height of his power, Hudurshi even compared himself to his illustrious ancestor, Modu. Due to growing regionalism among the Xiongnu, however, Hudurshi was never able to establish unquestioned authority. In contravention of a principle of fraternal succession established by Huhanye, Hudurshi designated his son Punu as heir apparent. 
However, as the eldest son of the preceding Chanu, Bai Pai, the Rizu king of the right, had a more legitimate claim. Consequently, Bai refused to attend the annual meeting at the Chanu's court. Nevertheless, in 46 AD, Punu ascended the throne. In 48 AD, a confederation of eight Xiongnu tribes in Bai's power base in the south, with a military force totaling 40,000 to 50,000 men, seceded from Punu's kingdom and acclaimed Bai as Chanu. This kingdom became known as the Southern Xiongnu. Topic: The Northern Xiongnu. The Rump Kingdom under Punu, around the Orkhon, modern North Central Mongolia, became known as the Northern Xiongnu. Punu, who became known as the Northern Chanu, began to put military pressure on the Southern Xiongnu. In 49 AD, Tsi Yung, a Han governor of Liaodong, allied with the Wuwan and Shenbei, attacked the northern Xiongnu. The northern Xiongnu suffered two major defeats, one at the hands of the Shenbei in 85 AD, and by the Han during the Battle of Ikh Bayan, in 89 AD. The northern Chanu fled to the northwest with his subjects. In about 155 AD, the northern Xiongnu were decisively crushed and subjugated by the Shenbei. The Southern Xiongnu Coincidentally, the Southern Xiongnu were plagued by natural disasters and misfortunes, in addition to the threat posed by Punu. Consequently, in 50 AD, the Southern Xiongnu submitted to tributary relations with Han China. The system of tribute was considerably tightened by the Han, to keep the Southern Xiongnu under control. The Chanu was ordered to establish his court in the Meiji district of Xihe Commandary and the southern Xiongnu were resettled in eight frontier commandaries. At the same time, large numbers of Chinese were also resettled in these commandaries, in mixed Han Xiongnu settlements. Economically, the southern Xiongnu became reliant on trade with the Han. Tensions were evident between Han settlers and practitioners of the nomadic way of life. Thus, in 94, Anguo Chanu joined forces with newly subjugated Xiongnu from the north and started a large-scale rebellion against the Han. During the late 2nd century AD, the southern Xiongnu were drawn into the rebellions then plaguing the Han court. In 188, the Chanu was murdered by some of his own subjects for agreeing to send troops to help the Han suppress a rebellion in Hebei. Many of the Xiongnu feared that it would set a precedent for unending military service to the Han court. The murdered Chanyu's son Yufala, entitled Chijizizhu, Kai Ji Shi Zhu Hu succeeded him, but was then overthrown by the same rebellious faction in 189. He traveled to Luoyang, the Han capital, to seek aid from the Han court, but at this time the Han court was in disorder from the clash between Grand General He Jin and the eunuchs, and the intervention of the warlord Dong Zhou. The Chanyu had no choice but to settle down with his followers in Pingyang, a city in Shaanxi. In 195, he died and was succeeded as Chanu by his brother Huchiquan Chanu. In 215-216 AD, the warlord statesman Cao Cao detained Huchiquan Chanu in the city of Yi, and divided his followers in Shaanxi into five divisions, left, right, south, north, and center. This was aimed at preventing the exiled Xiongnu in Shaanxi from engaging in rebellion, and also allowed Cao Cao to use the Xiongnu as auxiliaries in his cavalry. Later the Xiongnu aristocracy in Shaanxi changed their surname from Luanti to Lu for prestige reasons, claiming that they were related to the Han imperial clan through the old intermarriage policy. After Huchiquan, the southern Xiongnu were partitioned into five local tribes. Each local chief was under the surveillance of a Chinese resident, while the Shanu was in semi-captivity at the imperial court. Later Xiongnu states Topic <laughs> <laughs> Former Zhao state 304 to 329 Han Zhao dynasty 304 to 318 in 304 Lu Yuan became Chanu of the five hordes in 308 declared himself emperor and founded the Han Zhao dynasty in 311, his son and successor Liu Kong captured Luoyang, and with it the Emperor Wei of Jin China. In 316, the Emperor Min of Jin China was captured in Chang'an. 
Both emperors were humiliated as cupbearers in Lin Fun before being executed in 313 and 318. North China came under Xiongnu rule while the remnants of the Jin dynasty survived in the south at Jiangking. The reign of Liu Yao 318 to 329 in 318, after suppressing a coup by a powerful minister in the Xiongnu Han court, in which the emperor and a large proportion of the aristocracy were massacred, the Xiongnu prince Liu Yao moved the Xiongnu Han capital from Pingyang to Chang'an and renamed the dynasty as Zhao. Liu Yuan had declared the empire's name Han to create a linkage with Han dynasty to which he claimed he was a descendant, through a princess, but Liu Yao felt that it was time to end the linkage with Han and explicitly restore the linkage to the great Xiongnu Chanu Mountain, and therefore decided to change the name of the state. However, this was not a break from Liu Yuan, as he continued to honor Liu Yuan and Liu Kong posthumously, it is hence known to historians collectively as Han Zhao. However, the eastern part of North China came under the control of a rebel Xiongnu Han general of Jia ancestry named Xila. Liu Yao and Xila fought a long war until 329, when Liu Yao was captured in battle and executed. Chang'an fell to Xila soon after, and the Xiongnu dynasty was wiped out. North China was ruled by Xi Li's later Zhao dynasty for the next 20 years, however, the Liu Xiongnu remained active in the north for at least another century. Tifu and Sha, 260–431 The northern Tifu branch of the Xiongnu gained control of the Inner Mongolian region in the ten years between the conquest of the Tuba Shenbei state of Dai by the former Qin Empire in 376, and its restoration in 386 as the Northern Way. After 386, the Tifu were gradually destroyed by or surrendered to the Tuba, with the submitting Tifu becoming known as the Dugu. Lu Bobo, a surviving prince of the Tifu fled to the Ordos Loop, where he founded a state called the Sha thus named because of the Xiongnu's supposed ancestry from the Sha dynasty and changed his surname to Helian. Helian. The Helian Sha state was conquered by the Northern Wei in 428–31, and the Xiongnu thenceforth effectively ceased to play a major role in Chinese history, assimilating into the Shenbei and Han ethnicities. Tongwencheng meaning, unite all nations, was the capital of the Sha 16 kingdoms, whose rulers claimed descent from Modu Chanu. The ruined city was discovered in 1996 and the state council designated it as a cultural relic under top state protection. The repair of the Yang'an platform, where Helian Bobo, emperor of the Da Sha regime, reviewed parading troops, has been finished and restoration on the 31-meter tall turret follows. <laughs> Juku and Northern Liang 401 The Juku were a branch of the Xiongnu. Their leader Juku Mengshuan took over the northern Liang by overthrowing the former puppet ruler Duan Yi. By 439, the Juku power was destroyed by the northern Wei. Their remnants were then settled in the city of Gaocheng before being destroyed by the Roran. <laughs> Interpretation Barfield attempted to interpret Xiongnu history as well as narrate it. He made the following points, the Xiongnu confederation was unusually long-lived for a steppe empire. The purpose of raiding China was not simply for goods, but to force the Chinese to pay regular tribute. The power of the Xiongnu ruler was based on his control of Chinese tribute which he used to reward his supporters. The Han and Xiongnu empires rose at the same time because the Xiongnu state depended on Chinese tribute. A major Xiongnu weakness was the custom of lateral succession. If a dead ruler's son was not old enough to take command, power passed to the late ruler's brother. This worked in the first generation but could lead to civil war in the second generation. The first time this happened, in 60 BC, the weaker party adopted what Barfield calls the inner frontier strategy. They moved south and submitted to China and then used Chinese resources to defeat the northern Xiongnu and re establish the empire. The second time this happened, about 47 AD, the strategy failed. The southern ruler was unable to defeat the northern ruler and the Xiongnu remained divided. <laughs> Theories regarding ethnolinguistic identity 
The sound of the first Chinese character Shang has been reconstructed as Qo in Old Chinese. The Chinese name for the Zongnu was a pejorative term in itself, as the characters have the meaning of fierce slave. The Chinese characters are pronounced as Zongnu in modern Mandarin Chinese. Huns The supposed Old Chinese sound of the first character Shang has a possible similarity with the name Hun in European languages. The second character Nu appears to have no parallel in Western terminology. Whether the similarity is evidence of kinship or mere coincidence is hard to tell. It could lend credence to the theory that the Huns were in fact descendants of the northern Xiongnu who migrated westward, or that the Huns were using a name borrowed from the northern Xiongnu, or that these Xiongnu made up part of the Hun Confederation. The Xiongnu Hun hypothesis originated with the 18th century French historian Joseph de Guines, who noticed that ancient Chinese scholars had referred to members of tribes associated with the Xiongnu by names similar to Hun, albeit with varying Chinese characters. Etienne de la Vicière has shown that, in the Sogdian script used in the so called Sogdian ancient letters, both the Xiongnu and Huns were referred to as Gamma Wn, XWN, indicating that the two were synonymous. Although the theory that the Xiongnu were precursors of the Huns known later in Europe is now accepted by many scholars, it has yet to become a consensus view. The identification with the Huns may be either incorrect or an oversimplification as would appear to be the case with a proto-Mongol people, the Roran, who have sometimes been linked to the Avars of Central Europe. <laughs> Iranian theories Harold Walter Bailey proposed an Iranian origin of the Zongnu, recognizing all the earliest Zongnu names of the 2nd century BC as being of the Iranian type. This theory is supported by Turkologist Henrik Jankowski. Central Asian scholar Christopher I. Beckwith notes that the Zongnu name could be a cognate of Scythian, Sakha and Sogdia, corresponding to a name for northern Iranians. According to Beckwith the Zongnu could have contained a leading Iranian component when they started out, but more likely they had earlier been subjects of an Iranian people and learned from them the Iranian nomadic model. In the UNESCO-published History of Civilizations of Central Asia, its editor Janos Harmata concludes that the royal tribes and kings of the Zongnu bore Iranian names, that all Zongnu words noted by the Chinese can be explained from a Scythian language, and that it is therefore clear that the majority of Xiong Nu tribes spoke an Eastern Iranian language. Topic. Mongolic theories Mongolian and other scholars have suggested that the Xiongnu spoke a language related to the Mongolic languages. Mongolian archaeologists proposed that the Slab grave culture people were the ancestors of the Xiongnu, and some scholars have suggested that the Xiongnu may have been the ancestors of the Mongols. According to the Book of Song, section Jujin, Jujin's Roran Kaganate alternative name was Tatar, or Tartar, and they were a Zongnu tribe. Quote dot, Nikita Bichiran considered Zongnu and Shenbei to be two subgroups or dynasties, but the same ethnicity. Genghis Khan refers to the time of Modu Chanu as the remote times of our Chanu in his letter to Taoist Chu Chuji. Sun and moon symbol of Zongnu that discovered by archaeologists is similar to Mongolian Soyambo symbol. Topic. Turkic theories Proponents of a Turkic language theory include E. H. Parker, Jean-Pierre Abel Remusat, Julius Klaproth, Karakichi Shiratori, Gustav John Ramsted, Anne-Marie von Gabain, and Omeljan Pritzak. Some sources say the ruling class was proto-Turkic, while others suggest it was proto-Hun. Craig Benjamin sees the Zongnu as either Proto-Turks or Proto-Mongols who possibly spoke a language related to the Dingling. Both the 7th century Chinese history of the Northern Dynasties and the Book of Zhou, an inscription in the Sogdian language, report the Turks to be a subgroup of the Huns. Topic: <laughs> Unisean theories. Lyosh Lajeti was the first to suggest that the Zongnu spoke a Yeniseian language. In the early 1960s Edwin Pulleyblank was the first to expand upon this idea with credible evidence. 
In 2000, Alexander Vovin reanalyzed Polyblank's argument and found further support for it by utilizing the most recent reconstruction of Old Chinese phonology by Starostin and Baxter and a single Chinese transcription of a sentence in the language of the Jia people, a member tribe of the Xiongnu Confederacy. Previous Turkic interpretations of the aforementioned sentence do not match the Chinese translation as precisely as using Unisean grammar. Polybank and D. N. Cately asserted that the Xiongnu titles were originally Siberian words but were later borrowed by the Turkic and Mongolic peoples. The Xiongnu language gave to the later Turkic and Mongolian empires a number of important culture words, including Turkish Tangri, Mongolian Tengeri, was originally the Xiongnu word for heaven, Chungli, Th -a -acute -w -r -j. Titles such as Tarkhan and Tegan and Kagan were also inherited from the Xiongnu language. Multiple ethnicities Since the early 19th century, a number of Western scholars have proposed a connection between various language families or subfamilies and the language or languages of the Xiongnu. Albert Therrien de la Couperie considered them to be multi-component groups. Many scholars believe the Xiongnu Confederation was a mixture of different ethno-linguistic groups, and that their main language as represented in the Chinese sources and its relationships have not yet been satisfactorily determined. Kim rejects old racial theories or even ethnic affiliations in favor of the historical reality of these extensive, multi-ethnic, polyglot steppe empires. Chinese sources link the Tla people and Ashina to the Xiongnu, not all Turkic peoples. According to the Book of Zhou and the History of the Northern Dynasties, the Ashina clan was a component of the Xiongnu Confederation, but this connection is disputed, and according to the Book of Sui and the Tongdian, they were mixed nomads. Traditional Chinese, Zahu simplified Chinese, Zahu Pinyin, Zahu from Pingliang. The Ashina and Tla may have been separate ethnic groups who mixed with the Xiongnu. Indeed, Chinese sources link many nomadic peoples who, see Wu Hu, on their northern borders to the Xiongnu, just as Greco-Roman historiographers called Avars and Huns Scythians. The Greek cognate of Torquia Greek, Torquia was used by the Byzantine emperor and scholar Constantine VII Porphyrogenitus in his book De Administrando Imperio, though in his use, Turks, always referred to Magyars. Such archizing was a common literary topos, and implied similar geographic origins and nomadic lifestyle but not direct filiation. Some Uyghurs claimed descent from the Xiongnu according to Chinese history Waishu, the founder of the Uyghur Khaganate was descended from a Xiongnu ruler, but many contemporary scholars do not consider the modern Uyghurs to be of direct linear descent from the old Uyghur Khaganate because modern Uyghur language and old Uyghur languages are different. Rather, they consider them to be descendants of a number of people, one of them the ancient Uyghurs. <laughs> <laughs> Language isolate theories The Turkologist Gerhard Dorfer has denied any possibility of a relationship between the Xiongnu language and any other known language and rejected in the strongest terms any connection with Turkic or Mongolian. Topic: Archaeology and genetics. The original geographic location of the Xiongnu is disputed among steppe archaeologists. Since the 1960s, the geographic origin of the Xiongnu has attempted to be traced through an analysis of early Iron Age burial constructions. No region has been proven to have mortuary practices that clearly match that of the Xiongnu. Topic: Archaeology. The political center of the Xiongnu state was in Mongolia, and almost all of the Xiongnu kings were buried in Mongolia. In the 1920s, Pyotr Kozlov's excavations of the royal tombs at the Noin Ula burial site in northern Mongolia that date to around the first century CE provided a glimpse into the lost world of the Xiongnu. Other archaeological sites have been unearthed in Inner Mongolia and elsewhere, they represent the Neolithic and historical periods of the Xiongnu's history. Those included the Ordos culture, many of them had been identified as the Xiongnu cultures. The region was occupied predominantly by peoples showing Mongoloid features, known from their skeletal remains and artifacts. 
Portraits found in the Noin Ula excavations demonstrate other cultural evidences and influences, showing that Chinese and Xiongnu art have influenced each other mutually. Some of these embroidered portraits in the Noin Ula kurgans also depict the Xiongnu with long braided hair with wide ribbons, which is seen to be identical with the Ashina clan hair style. Well-preserved bodies in Xiongnu and pre-Xiongnu tombs in the Mongolian Republic and southern Siberia show both Mongoloid and Caucasian features. Analysis of skeletal remains from sites attributed to the Xiongnu provides an identification of dolichocephalic mongoloid, ethnically distinct from neighboring populations in present-day Mongolia. Russian and Chinese anthropological and craniofacial studies show that the Xiongnu were physically very heterogeneous, with six different population clusters showing different degrees of mongoloid and caucasoid physical traits. These clusters point to significant cross-regional migrations both east to west and west to east that likely started in the Neolithic period and continued to the medieval Mongolian period. Presently, there exist four fully excavated and well-documented cemeteries, Evolga, Dairestui, Birkin Tolgoi, and Daudunzi. Additionally thousands of tombs have been recorded in Transbaikalia and Mongolia. In addition to these, the Tamir-1 excavation site from a 2005 Silk Road Arkhanghai excavation project is the only Zongnu cemetery in Mongolia to be fully mapped in scale. Tamir-1 was located on Tamirin Ulan Kashu, a prominent granitic outcrop near other cemeteries of the Neolithic, Bronze Age, and Mongol periods. Important finds at the site included a lacquer bowl, glass beads, and three TLV mirrors. Archaeologists from this project believe that these artifacts paired with the general richness and size of the graves suggests that this cemetery was for more important or wealthy Xiongnu individuals. The TLV mirrors are of particular interest. Three mirrors were acquired from three different graves at the site. The mirror found at feature 160 is believed to be a low-quality, local imitation of a Han mirror, while the whole mirror found at feature 100 and fragments of a mirror found at feature 109 are believed to belong to the classical TLV mirrors and date back to the Xin dynasty or the early to Middle Eastern Han period. The archaeologists have chosen to, for the most part, refrain from positing anything about Han Zongnu relations based on these particular mirrors. However, they were willing to mention the following, there is no clear indication of the ethnicity of this tomb occupant, but in a similar brick-chambered tomb of late Eastern Han period at the same cemetery, archaeologists discovered a bronze seal with the official title that the Han government bestowed upon the leader of the Xiongnu. The excavators suggested that these brick-chamber tombs all belong to the Xiongnu Qinghai 1993. Classifications of these burial sites make distinction between two prevailing type of burials. 1. Monumental ramped terrace tombs which are often flanked by smaller satellite burials and 2. Circular or ring burials. Quote, Some scholars consider this a division between elite graves and commoner graves. Other scholars, find this division too simplistic and not evocative of a true distinction because it shows ignorance of the nature of the mortuary investments and typically luxuriant burial assemblages and does not account for the discovery of other lesser interments that do not qualify as either of these types. Genetics <inaudible> 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 A majority of the Xiongnu sequences can be classified as belonging to Asian haplogroups, and nearly 11% belong to European haplogroups. Over the past decade, Chinese archaeologists have published several reviews regarding the results of excavations in Xinjiang. They imply the Xiongnu's supreme ruling class. Particularly interesting are the tombs in the cemetery at Haiguliang, Xinjiang, the Black Goliang Cemetery, also known as the Summer Palace of the Xiongnu King, east of the Barkal Basin, near the city of Hami. By typing results of DNA samples during the excavation of one of the tombs, it was determined that of the 12 men, 6 Q1A asterisk, not Q1A1M120, not Q1A1BM25, not Q1A2M3, 4 Q1BM378, 2 Q asterisk, not Q1A, not Q1B, unable to determine subclades. In a paper, Li Hongji 2012, the author analyzed the Y DNAs of the ancient male samples from the 2nd or 1st century BCE cemetery at Haiguliang in Xinjiang, which is also believed to be the site of a summer palace for Xiongnu kings, which is east of the Barkal Basin and near the city of Hami. 
The Y-DNA of 12 men excavated from the site belonged to QMEH2 Q1A or QM378 Q1B. The QM378 men among them were regarded as hosts of the tombs, half of the QMEH2 men appeared to be hosts and the other half as sacrificial victims. Culture Artistic distinctions Within the Xiongnu culture more variety is visible from site to site than from era to era in terms of the Chinese chronology, yet all form a whole that is distinct from that of the Han and other peoples of the non-Chinese north. In some instances iconography can not be used as the main cultural identifier because art depicting animal predation is common among the steppe peoples. An example of animal predation associated with Xiongnu culture is a tiger carrying dead prey. We see a similar image in work from Maokingu, a site which is presumed to have been under Xiongnu political control but is still clearly non-Xiongnu. From Maokingu, we see the prey replaced by an extension of the tiger's foot. The work also depicts a lower level of execution. Maokingu work was executed in a rounder, less detailed style. In its broadest sense, Xiongnu iconography of animal predation include examples such as the gold headdress from Alushedeng and gold earrings with a turquoise and jade inlay discovered in Ziguban, Inner Mongolia. The gold headdress can be viewed, along with some other examples of Xiongnu art, from the external links at the bottom of this article. Xiongnu art is harder to distinguish from Sakha or Scythian art. There was a similarity present in stylistic execution, but Xiongnu art and Sakha art did often differ in terms of iconography. Sakha art does not appear to have included predation scenes, especially with dead prey, or same animal combat. Additionally, Sakha art included elements not common to Xiongnu iconography, such as a winged, horned horse. The two cultures also used two different bird heads. Zongnu depictions of birds have a tendency to have a moderate eye and beak and have ears, while Sakha birds have a pronounced eye and beak and no ears. Some scholars claim these differences are indicative of cultural differences. Scholar Sophia Karen Saras claims that Zongnu images of animal predation, specifically tiger plus prey, is spiritual, representative of death and rebirth, and same animal combat is representative of the acquisition of or maintenance of power. Rock art and writing The rock art of the Yin and Helen Mountains is dated from the 9th millennium BC to the 19th century AD. It consists mainly of engraved signs petroglyphs and only minimally of painted images. Excavations conducted between 1924 and 1925 in the Noin Ula Kurgans produced objects with over 20 carved characters, which were either identical or very similar to that of to the runic letters of the old Turkic alphabet discovered in the Orkhon Valley. From this is some scholars hold that the Xiongnu had a script similar to Eurasian runiform and this alphabet itself served as the basis for the ancient Turkic writing. The records of the Grand Historian volume 110 state that when the Xiongnu noted down something or transmitted a message, they made cuts on a piece of wood. They also mention a Hu script. Topic: <laughs> Diet Xiongnu were a nomadic people. From their lifestyle of herding flocks and their horse trade with China, we can conclude that their diet consists mainly of mutton, horse meat and wild geese that were shot down. <laughs> Possible connection to Silla dynasty In various kinds of ancient inscriptions on monuments of Munmu of Silla, it is recorded that King Silla came from Xiongnu. Also, there are some Korean researchers point out grave goods of Silla and Zongnu are alike and also some researchers propose that Silla King is descended from Zongnu. About this, the Korean public broadcaster KBS has reported a documentary. See also List of Zongnu rulers Chanius. Rulers family tree Nomadic Empire Ethnic groups in Chinese history History of the Han Dynasty Ban Yang Zubu 
equals equals notes <laughs>